Good morning once again, and we welcome you to <clears throat> the last day of our sitting together, watch and pray at midnight. And I would like to certainly co-sign the words of the previous speaker, Pastor Randy Skeet. I agree so very much with what he has had to say. When you come down to the last part of any series of meetings, for me personally, there is always this burden to say just the right thing or to, to try to put the right finish on something. I always have a burden when I come to the last of any uh, meeting or a series of meetings to try to say what needs to be said. And sometimes there's a fear that I have not said what needed to be said. And I've listened to the messages from all of the various speakers who have preached present truth and who have preached compelling messages. And uh, I, I'm pleased to, to hear uh, the quality and the tenor, the texture, the tone, the flavor of these messages, for they have been right on as far as they've centered in on what we need to do and what we need to be and how we need to equip ourselves in these last days as we are just prior to midnight in this earth's history when Christ is about to deliver his people. So I carry that same burden as Randy, uh, listening very closely to what he has had to say over the past several days, along with Pastor Bohr, Pastor Mirage, and uh, of course, uh, James Rafferty. And I'm very pleased, I must say, to, to work at a ministry where truth is preached unapologetically, where the word of God is preached with power and conviction. Certainly, our president and leader, uh, Pastor Bohr, does that. And now that we have added to the staff, uh, Pastor James Rafferty, a man of considerable skill with the word of God and a preacher of truth and righteousness. Um, I find that the team is, team is growing in the kinds of ways that it ought to grow, adding to its ranks men of honesty and integrity and some facility with the word of God. I've listened to uh, James several times uh, at other ministries and listening to him over this past weekend. I am assured once again that he is a teacher of the word, but also that he lives what he, uh, he practices what he preaches. I want to take this opportunity uh, also to thank the production crew who has done such a fabulous job. They've been here these several days, long days, and having been a production manager and worked on several large productions, I know the kind of work that they have put in. Uh, Steve Jr. there as director and Lorraine is back there and the crew that's out here manning the cameras. Um, uh, we thank them all for the work that they're doing. This is no mean uh, enterprise to try to put on so many hours of production is, is uh, quite a feat. Uh, uh, those who have helped to feed us during this time, Eileen and, and crew uh, and Angela, and uh, who is responsible for the idea and for putting this all together. We thank them one and all. Um, you know, they always say that when you, a person comes down to his last words, you ought to listen very carefully to them because they, they say uh, what is most important in their life and they, they bespeak what is of value to them. And so as we come down to our last presentation, I have entitled it The Age of Do. The age of do, and we will walk our way through that in just a few moments. Um, as Pastor Bohr comes after me and others uh, come to speak their final time for this particular sitting, you will note what is on their hearts, <coughs> excuse me, and the burden that they have that we leave you with something that will be of value to your walk in Christ Jesus and that will spur you as each day indeed brings us closer to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is not a game, brothers and sisters. This is serious business. We live in serious times. The enemy is working very, very hard to discourage, to distract, to dissuade, to destroy God's people. And we must be about our Father's business, given the realization that God can do anything but fail. So I thank him 
for his presence and power in Secrets Unsealed, for the team that has been assembled here, and for the evident blessings of the hand of God on this particular ministry, and for the addition of our, our newest member, Pastor James Rafferty, who I know is going to do a fabulous job for the Lord. I would ask you to turn with me again uh, to the book of Mark. Our messages have come from this same book of Mark. We want to uh, zero in on chapter 14, and hopefully I have enough time to go through all that um, is in my heart to do as we ruminate, as it were, on the subject, the age of do. The age of do. Bow your heads with me in a word of prayer, if you will. Father God, again we come to you humbly yet boldly, asking you, beseeching you, importuning you for your goodness and your grace and for your power to be made manifest through this frail, failing human instrument. Would you make up for the deficiencies of the human instrument with divine grace so that your people may know and hear and understand and be empowered to do. Bless us, dear Lord, as we open your word, and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 14, I'm reading from the New King James. The reading is rather long, but um, I will begin at verse 2 and continue down through about eight and a half, or um, perhaps include nine. Uh, we start sort of in the middle of thought, beginning at, beginning at verse two. The Bible says, but they said not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly spikenard. Then she broke the flask, and she opened it, and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Jesus got her back. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, Christ speaking, you do not have always. I'm not going to be here forever. Verse 8, she hath done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burying, for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Amen. And amen. To the discerning eye, and this is interesting, there are many parallels that can be seen and drawn between the state of society in the days just prior to the coming of Christ as a babe in Bethlehem and his anticipated coming uh, in power and glory the second time. This is interesting. I was reading in my uh, morning watch this morning. And as I picked up the morning watch for this date, December 6, 2020, the first words in the morning watch were, it is at midnight that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. And so the, the message, the burden of the morning watch is precisely the same as what we've been talking about the last several days. It is at midnight. We've been talking about at midnight. Is that coincidence? 
possibly, probably, maybe not. But there it stands. Um, it is at midnight, the very first words of the morning watch. There are parallels that can be seen in the days just prior to the first coming and these days just prior to the second coming. And I need to hasten to this quickly because this is not the sermon. This is just a little ecclesiological obiter dictum. Just a little something we're putting in that runs across my mind. It occurs to me. Ellen White outlines the social, societal, uh, and mental conditions of the world just before Christ came. She says men were looking with longing eyes for hope. That is certainly true of the world now. She says men were weary. When we say men, men and women, boys and girls, the world, weary of pageant and fable. We are weary of fake religion and false religion and, and pageant and fable and, and so much that is not of consequence and that is not real. People are longing for religion that can satisfy the soul. It was the same way in the days just before Christ came the first time. Ellen White says the, the systems of heathenism were losing hold on people. People were tired of, of fable and fiction. They wanted truth. They wanted something that they could spiritually bite down on that would satisfy their souls. People were asking questions that society could not answer. It was that way when Christ was coming as a babe in Bethlehem, it is that way now just before Christ comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What is interesting, uh, she says the world was set up, as it were, for the coming of Christ. You read this in uh, Desire of Ages in the chapter, The Fullness of Time. The world was under one government. That government was Rome. Today with globalization, the world is, is smaller than it's ever been before. The world is quite small. And though you've got many, many governments, the world is so interconnected. The truth is, if one big nation like China or the United States or Great Britain or Germany or France or one of these large powers sneezes, the rest of the world tends to catch cold because that's the way the world is. It is much smaller and the effect of one nation upon the other is, is much more so than ever before. Language doesn't separate us anymore. Now, back in, in uh, the days just prior to the coming of Christ as a babe in Bethlehem, Ellen White says that the, the, the language, the common language was Greek, some Aramaic, but the, the language of, of consequence was Greek. Uh, people of learning, people of knowledge, people of education were speaking Greek. Um, language is no longer a barrier. I bought something just the other day. I bought it here with me. Just a little, a little device that uh, I have. And uh, this little device, with this little device, ye, I can go to any country almost in the world and communicate with them instantly just by programming and pressing this little device. I bought it just a few days ago, cost less than 100 bucks. You program in the language you want to speak. Uh, I can go to Panama, to my wife's country, speak English in, and Spanish comes out. I can hear someone else uh, put this near to them, they will speak Spanish, and English comes out. The same with Japanese and Russian and Portuguese and French. Almost any language in the world can come out of this little device. And if you don't have a little device like this, most cell phones will, will do this for you. So simply download a language app. So language is no longer a barrier. The gospel can be preached in almost any language instantaneously. The gospel can go around the world. Um, we are here at this ministry. Uh, signal sent up to uh, uh, the Internet or sent up to a satellite comes down three point something seconds later. All around the world, the gospel can be preached. Uh, it can go through country barriers. It can go through walls. It can go almost anywhere God wants it to go. And so the world, again, is ripe for the coming of our Lord. Uh, and things are set up to get the gospel out, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. So I call this the age of do. Now, if you want to do an interesting study, you want to do an interesting Bible study. Look at the last weeks of, the last days of the life of Christ. 
the times, the events, the people, even nature itself began to resonate with the urgency of the times. And it's, it's this way now, as we look at the waning moments of the history of planet Earth. Now, the Bible gives us glimpses into the lives of the constellation of individuals who circled in the orbit around the Messiah. Lives that were being touched for eternity. It is a most intriguing study, story after story, story surrounding story, story within story, backstory, hidden story, story undergirding story. So much is packed into this compressed period of time that uh, encompasses the last weeks, the last days, the last months of the life of Christ. Ellen White encourages us that each of us would do well to spend a thoughtful moment each day musing over the closing scenes of Christ's earthly ministry. You will find those scenes fascinating, but also spiritually uplifting. As you see what Jesus went through, what he endured to save you and me. And it is a humbling thing to know that the king of the universe went through so much to save your soul and to save mine. So I call this time the age of do. And one of the heroines, the persons, the protagonists, if you will, of that age of do is here in Mark chapter 14. And that, of course, course, is Mary. Now, I need to state here at this juncture, Christ said she did what she could. I'm going to come back to that. We need to hold on to that statement. It will be revisited. Mary was lauded and applauded because Jesus said she did what she could. She was lionized. She was applauded because of what she did. Now, I need to state here parenthetically so nobody gets me wrong. Because I'm going to talk about doing. I'm not talking about a legalistic attempt to curry favor with God by doing stuff. I'm not talking about trying to work our way into heaven. I'm talking about doing that is a response to what Jesus has already done. In other words, we love him because he first loved us. That love that comes from us is a response to a love initiative from God. We serve him because he has already sacrificed his life for us. So our doing is not an attempt to please him or to uh, curry favor with him. Our doing is in response to what he has already done. Christ did. So now I can do through the power of the indwelling Christ. Now, I make that point because I don't want what I am saying to be confused in any way, on any wise, with a legalistic attempt to try to please God or to try to get righteousness. The moment you begin to talk about do, people will want to holler legalism. No, we're not talking about legalism. We're talking about the response of the heart to a divine initiative that sent Christ to the cross and that promised promises to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Christ, which enables us to be like Jesus, which enables us to do. 
And let me add this. It is my settled belief, given what we have just stated, that the dividing line between those who will be on the inside looking out and those who will be on the outside looking in, those who will be saved, those who will be lost, those who will be sealed for salvation, and those who will be tended to perdition, the line ultimately, in my mindset, is do or don't do. Do or don't do. In the final analysis, it is not so much, I say so much, what you say, not so much what you think, it is what you do. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with salvation? What are you going to do with the sacrifice that has been made for you? How are you going to respond to the initiative, the salvation initiative that brought Christ from the realms of glory to walk this earth 33.5 years and sacrifice his life for you, what are you going to do with that reality? A lot of people are going to be saved, an awful lot of people. 144,000, the big number represents an even bigger number. But a lot of people are also going to be lost. And a lot of people will be lost because of what they failed to do in response to God's love initiative. I turn you to Matthew chapter 24. I refer you rather to Matthew 24, 14. You know the text. The Bible says simply, Matthew 24, 14, that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Then the end will come. Very familiar text. That text is a prediction. That text is a promise. That text is also a prophecy. It is all of those things. It's a prediction that the gospel is going to be preached. It's a prophecy that the gospel is going to be preached, but it's also a promise that the gospel will be preached and the end will come. We know that God is fair and just. God is going to see to it. If God says the gospel will be preached, well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters? The gospel is going to be preached. And if God says the end will come, even though it may be delayed, even though we cannot necessarily see light at the end of the tunnel, the truth is, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters one day and one day soon, all of this is going to end and the end will come. God will see to it that everyone has a chance to make a decision for or against Jesus and salvation. So it's a promise that the gospel will be preached in all the world. The gospel is going to go to the furthest ends of the earth. No one will be able to say, I had no idea, I had no inkling, I was not aware that Christ was coming soon. I was out to lunch that day. I missed the memo. I didn't know that Jesus had claims on my life and that he was coming back to give out his reward. We know that God will make sure that the world is warned before Probation closes, which is one of the reasons, brothers and sisters, we talked about this yesterday in the question and answer period. It is one of the reasons for the apparent, and I put that in quotes, apparent delay. The train, ladies and gentlemen, is late 
for love. The gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth so that not one soul can say, I did not know, I was not informed, God is not fair, I didn't have a chance. So God will see to it that you know. But the question, the salvific question is, in my mind, the most important question in the universe is once you know, once God has done his job, what are you going to do with Jesus? God will see to it that you know enough. But you must answer the question, now that I know, what am I going to do? How then will I respond? Now, we don't work alone. The Holy Spirit is there to help us, to aid us in spreading the gospel. Angels are there to aid us in spreading the gospel. The grace of Christ is there to assist us in the work of spreading the gospel. That's why I love Philippians chapter 2, 5, which says, Let this mind be in you. Praise God that we can work with the mind of Christ in us to motivate us, to actuate us, to push us forward, to do the grace of God. So Christ can and does work in us for us and through us so that we can do what God has called us to do, so that we can respond appropriately to the love initiative of Jesus Christ. Once you know, you are called to do. James chapter 4, uh, verse 17, Therefore, who, to him who knows to do, you see that. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. That's James' burden. So once we know to do and we do not do, we fall into the state of sin. There's no way to get around, to get away from the call on our lives to do the will of God. I say again, we are in the age of do. You see, I have, as of, as of late, become convicted that a lot of people who are going to miss out on heaven, in reading the spirit of prophecy, reading the word of God, this is my digest. A lot of people who are going to miss out on heaven will miss out not because necessarily of what they did, but what they failed to do. Not so much what they did, but what they failed to do. There are many people on the earth, brothers and sisters, who are living reasonably moral lives. They are not murderers, they are not thieves, they are not drunkards, they are not embezzlers. They are decent citizens. They try to be honest and scrupulous in their business dealings. They are doing well. But they have not turned those lives over to Christ. And you don't get points in heaven for doing nice stuff. Salvation is not a consequence of you being a good citizen. Salvation is a consequence of giving your life to the Lord. So you may be honest and upright and outstanding and, and all of that stuff. But if you have not surrendered your life to Christ, those good deeds will avail you nothing. There are a large number of people who aren't doing anything particularly wrong, but they're not doing anything particularly right. And righteousness is right doing. 
that is a consequence of a surrendered life to Jesus Christ. Um, I remember years ago um, uh, listening to, to uh, Phil Donahue say, you know, uh, uh, come judgment day, God is just going to throw out the rule book and he loves us so much, he's just going to say, everybody come, come on in, come to heaven. Now that sounds good, but it is at variance with the truth of God. The rule, the rubric by which God judges everyone are the commandments of God, keeping those commandments as a consequence of a surrender life. In other words, Christ working in you. That's the hope of glory. Ellen White says this. The impressions of the Holy Spirit, if disregarded today, today will not be as strong tomorrow. She is telling us the Holy Spirit is constantly calling. The Holy Spirit is constantly controlling. The Holy Spirit is constantly asking you to surrender your life. Every day, every moment that you refuse and rebuff that spirit, the next time it calls, the voice will not be as strong. Now, that's not because the spirit is any weaker. It's that you are beginning to harden your heart and tune yourself away from the promptings of the spirit. The first time you say no, pretty difficult. But the 20th time, the 30th time you say no, uh, it gets a little bit easier. I remember years ago uh, a person who had gotten some trouble uh, embezzling money from a certain institution that I was on the board of. And they said, you know, the first time I just added a zero to uh, my check, felt pretty bad about it. Uh, the next time I added a zero, uh, I didn't feel quite as bad. And then after a while, Every couple of weeks when I got paid, I was adding that zero. And the money began to mount up, but my sensitivity to my sin was just not as bad. Well, it's the same way as, uh, as respects are working uh, against the call of the Spirit of God. God impresses you to do something or to say something or to give up something and you reject that call. Your sensitivity to the promptings of the Spirit of God are not as acute the next time the Spirit calls upon you. Listen to this statement from Desire of Ages, page 490. Ellen White says this. Our condemnation in the judgment will not result from the fact that we have been in error. Now these are people who are in the church. So they're not in error, but they're not fully embracing the truth that God is calling them to wrap their heart around. So our condemnation in the judgment will not result from the fact that we have been in error, but from the fact that we have neglected heaven sent opportunities for learning what is truth and growth. So God sends us every day opportunities to grow in him, to learn of him, to become stronger in him. It's not that you're in error. You're not walking the wrong way, but you're not growing either. You're not strengthening yourself either. You're not accepting heaven, divine, heaven, determined opportunities that are sent to you for your growth and your strength. Um, and this, of course, can happen at any point in your walk with Christ. Christ is sending you things. Christ is putting you through circumstances and situations that may be tough, that may be unnatural, that may move you out of your comfort zone, but they are sent to you so that you can become stronger in him and you can grow in him and to reject those opportunities to neglect those opportunities put your soul in jeopardy because of the things not that you did but that you failed to do so God will judge us among other things on what we did but also and hear me brothers and sisters also what we failed to do. In that vortex of judgment, we are told that we'll be judged on what we could have known, what we should have known, 
but were too lazy, too indolent, too insolent, too rebellious to search out. You've got a Bible sitting there on the coffee table or on the shelf. And rather than reading that Bible, you're doing other things that are taking you away from spending time with the Lord. You could have read it. You should have read it. You reject the invitation to go to church. You could have gone. You should have gone. Uh, you would have gone, but you didn't. And so your chance at your chances, because there are more that, that will come than, than just one time, are passing you by while you are flitting your life away. Well, you are going to pay a price for that. Now, I've got to go quickly. Let's go to the book of Deut Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I'm turning very quickly in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And I'm in Deuteronomy chapter 10. I want to do 12 and 13. Deuteronomy 10. I'm at 10 and I'm at verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And, verse 13, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you this day, for your good. So God is asking us to do, and the things that we do are for our good. This sounds remarkably like Micah chapter 6, 8. He has showed the old man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with thy God. Again, you cannot get away from doing for the Lord. Your, 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 your call is to do. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Don't have time to read it all, but the Bible is saying to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey. What is another word for obey. Do. To obey the call of God. And I liked what, what uh, Pastor Skeet said in the previous hour. You don't get wiggle room to negotiate with God as to the claims he has on your life. You don't get to bargain with God. You are called to do. Um, to obey is better than sacrifice. Uh, Saul said, I'll keep some of these animals alive for sacrifice. The Lord is not impressed with that. He's impressed with your obedience to his word. To obey the word exactly as it is given to you. You are called to do. And you do not get a pass on doing for Jesus. You must do what you are called to do, what you are given the privilege of doing, what you are strengthened by God to perform as a response to his love initiative. I go to Messages to Young People, page, page 41. We're talking about doing. We're talking about the age of do. Ellen White says this, to do less than this, and that's live a surrendered life, to do for the Lord. So that is the this. To do less than this is to refuse to make the most, hear me now, of God-given opportunities this is looked upon as treason against God. Did you hear me? To do less than this, and that is to live in surrender, to do for the Lord, to allow the Lord to work out his life through you, to let this mind be in you, <clears throat> which is the mind of Christ. To refuse to do this is to refuse to make the most of God-given opportunities, this is looked upon as treason against God. Now, treason is an awful strong word. And I wondered when I ran across that why God would choose that word. Uh, treason is a strong word. So God says, I'm going to send C.A. on a little mission. I'm going to give him some opportunities to grow and to learn and to strengthen and to serve so that he is blessed and in turn can be a blessing. But CA says, nah, I don't want to do that. I'm not in the mood to do that. I've got something else to do. I want to follow my own course. The Bible says that rejection of God sent opportunities for your growth, for my growth, for my strength, God says that's treason. 
It's a strong word. Now, I'm the type of person, uh, my wife will tell you, uh, when I get a word uh, that uh, I wonder about the context and why it is used and why it sits, I will spend hours just searching out that word. I will dig into that word and stay with that word until I get a complete understanding of that word. And so my sermon preparation will sometimes get be extended by hours because I got to find out what's the deal with that particular word. So when I saw the word treason, my mind says, of all the words that Ellen White could have employed, why would she use the word treason? It's an awful strong word. So I began to search treason. I looked up treason in any number of dictionaries. I didn't want just one. Uh, I looked it up in, in some of the classic dictionaries, and I looked to see the etymology of the word as it comes down to today. Um, and here's what I found in sort of synthesizing all of this material. Treason is an act calculated to overthrow the government or to harm or kill its sovereign. Interesting. Treason is an act calculated to overthrow the government or to harm or kill its sovereign. Now, that's, that's coming from a classic dictionary, the history of treason. Two, it is a violation of allegiance to one sovereign or one state. Now, that comes from a little more modern dictionary. So I took the classic definition, then I took the modern definition. So, an act calculated to overthrow the government or to harm or kill its sovereign. Two, a violation of allegiance to one's sovereign or state. So when you come up from the baptismal pool, you have publicly taken marriage vows to Christ, but more than that, you have validated your passport into your new country. You are no longer a citizen of this world. Your citizenship now is in heaven. And as you well know, even though you can hold dual citizenship in two countries, my wife is an example. She has her Panamanian citizenship and Irma has her United States citizenship. She has them both. She is naturalized. You cannot hold dual citizenship in the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. You are either in one fully or in the other, but you cannot have dual citizenship. You don't get a green card in heaven. You're either all in or you're not in. So you have committed, you have pledged allegiance through your surrender to Christ and through your baptismal vows uh, and going beneath the water, you have validated your passport into your new kingdom. So committing treason is the failure to uphold the tenets of your new government. You say you are a citizen of heaven, well then you've got to act like a citizen of heaven. You must do those things that citizens of heaven do. God says go next door and witness to your labor even though that neighbor is cranky and irascible and doesn't want to hear what you have to say. That's what Christ would do. That's what citizens of heaven do. So that's what you've got to do. You can say, well, I don't think they want to hear it. I don't want to disturb them. They probably wouldn't listen anyway. You can come up with any number of excuses for your treason, but treason is still treason. Uh, the Lord says something simple. Bring it a little closer to home. You need to apologize to your wife. You know that argument last night was not right. Now, you can hem and haw and think of all kind of ways and reasons why you shouldn't do it. Well, she started it. Uh, she talked mean to me, whatever. But God says this is for your growth and for your growing. And to not do this is 
Treason. Ah, you go to the supermarket and uh, you spend uh, some money for some goods and instead of giving you one dollar in change, they give you ten dollars in change. And you come home and you've got this ten dollar bill in your pocket and uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is saying you need to get in your car and go back to that store and take that $10 back uh, to that supermarket. Don't praise the Lord because their loss is your gain. You need to do that. And you say, well, I'm not going to do it. Uh, you know, too bad for them. Uh, good for me. God says that's a treasonous act. It is an act not in keeping with the rules of your new country. You are not representing your new country. That is treason. Um, I've, I've had this happen once. I went into a uh, bathroom of a, a church when I was quite young. And there in the men's room on the floor, $100 in cash. Uh, and I had a decision to make. Wasn't mine. Now, I could praise the Lord and say, ha ha, I got some money. Or I can take it to a deacon, I can take it to somebody else and say, hey, somebody lost $100. Well, I took it in. Uh, lost the money, but I felt pretty good about it because I knew I was doing the right thing. Now, I found out a couple things about treason. I've got to hustle through this. There are two kinds of treason, by the way. There is petite treason and high treason. Petite treason is when you break a vow, and this comes from the classic dictionary. We don't really use this much anymore, but this is part of the etymolo etymology of the word. Um, uh, petite treason is when you break a vow to a minor official or even a friend. I'll be there tomorrow, I guarantee, but tomorrow you don't show. That is petite treason. It's not a big deal. It was just a friend, but you did make a promise. You did give your word. You don't keep it. You don't do it. That's petite treason. Then there is, of course, the one that we are more familiar with. That is high treason. High treason is when you break an allegiance to a president, king, prime minister, or a government official, or to a nation. So when we refuse to prosecute the work of God, we are tearing away at the foundation of God. When we misrepresent the government of God, we are tearing away at the foundation of God and are guilty of trying to pull down de facto the government of God. That is high treason. Um, I don't have time to turn to the text. I'll just cite the references, Matthew 23, 23, and Luke eleven fourteen. 14. Um, Christ talking to the scribes and Pharisees, this ought ye to have done and not to have left the other undone. Chapter 23 as an invective against those who do the right thing for the wrong reason or those who, who, who don't do that which is right and who misrepresent the government of God. In verse 33 of Matthew 23, Christ asks the question, how can you escape the sentence, the condemnation of hell, um, ladies and gentlemen, by not doing those things that Christ insists we ought to do? Those are hypocritical actions. They are treason. Now, the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, treason, particularly high treason, is punishable by death. And in this case, the second death. So, failing to rightly represent the government of God is in effect, is de facto tearing down the government of God it is working against the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of your new government that you have pledged allegiance to and is effect treason. It is working against the sovereignty of God. Now, my time is getting away. I've got just a couple more things. Um, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 28, you know the story. Father goes away. He's got two sons. He asks one son, well, he asked both sons, go into the field and work. One son says, okay, I'll go. 
later on, changes his mind, does not go, rejects the work. The other son who immediately says, I'm not going to go, also has a change of heart, and then he chooses to go. The question which is all but rhetorical, who did the work of the father? The person who did the work of the father is the person who went to do the work of the father. It is the person who actually did the work. Again, you cannot get away from the call on your life to do. You cannot get away from the call on your life, on my life, to be about our father's business, particularly as we see, the Bible says, the day approaching, as we near the coming of the Lord. We as God's people must, one, make sure that we are on God's side. The call is given in 1 Corinthians and again in 2 Corinthians that we ought to examine ourselves and make sure that we are again doing the work of the Lord, not just talking about it, not just thinking about it, not just musing over it, but actually involved in the work of God and making sure that we are doing the work that God has assigned each of us to do. To do. Given the understanding that when we come to the Lord, there is a reward for that. Now, let me close by quickly saying this. When I was at uh, 3ABN, we had a prison ministry show. And um, spent, I spent a lot of time in federal and state prisons. One of the questions that is often asked in, in prison is, um, uh, what would you do to get in here? Why are you here? And, um, you know, all kinds of reasons are given. Um, it occurs to me that in hell, that question will not be asked for a number of reasons. Number one, no one will care because the Bible says that uh, those who will be lost, no one will be there to lament them. Uh, those who are saved will be in heaven rejoicing. And it doesn't matter. If you don't make it to the Lord, uh, to heaven, if you don't make it to Judgment Day in peace with your sins forgiven, it doesn't really matter why you didn't make it. It doesn't really matter what you did that uh, landed you outside of the kingdom of God. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's not important. Uh, the fact is that you didn't make it. We tend to rate and rank sin. We think of good sins, bad sins, that's just a man-made device we use when we want to try to prove that our sins are not any worse than the next person's sins or that their sins are worse than our sins. It doesn't matter why you don't get in because Christ died to get you in. He died to save you. When the Bible talks about keeping the commandments, it's talking about doing. When it talks about studying to show yourself approved, it's talking about doing. When it's talking about uh, surrendering to Christ, it's talking about doing. When the Bible warns us against treason, Ellen White is saying we must do or we are responsible for the tearing down of the kingdom of God. Mary was lauded and applauded, not because what she thought about Jesus, not because of what she said about Jesus. Christ said, this woman hath done what she could. And if each of us will do all we can, the kingdom of God will come and come quickly and we can go home with our Lord and Savior. God bless you.